Good morning. We are... We are reading The Last Vampire 3 Red Dice. Alyssa and her former FBI partner, Joel, partner, Joel learn of government plan to capture them in order to steal and analyze their vampire blood for the purpose of duplicating it. And when Joel is caught, Alyssa risks her life to free him. So that is going to be... That is the premise of this book. I am an ancient vampire. Blood does not bother me. I like blood. Even seeing my own blood. Oops. Even seeing my own blood does not frighten me. But what my blood can do to others, to the whole world for that matter, terrifies me. Once God made me take a vow to create no more vampires. Once I believed in God, but my belief like my vow has been shattered too many times in my long life. I am Alyssa Pern, the now forgotten Sita, child of a demon. I am the oldest living creature on earth. Okay, come on, come on. Loading. <sighs> okay, here we go. I am a vampire. Bl blood does not bother me. I like blood. Even seeing my own blood does not frighten me. But what my blood can do to others, to the whole world, for that matter, terrifies me. Once God made me take a vow to create no more vampires. Once I believe in God. But my belief, like my vow, has been shattered too many times in my long life. I am Alyssa Pern, the now forgotten Sita, child of a demon. I am the oldest living creature on earth. I awake in a living room, smelling of death. I watch as my blood tr trickles through a thin plastic tube into the arm of Special Agent Joel Drake, FBI. He now lives as a vampire instead of the human being he was when he closed his eyes. I have broken my promise to Lord Krishna. Joel did not ask me to make him a vampire. Indeed, he told me not to. To let him die in peace. But I did not listen. Therefore, Krishna's protection, his grace, no longer applies to me. Perhaps it is good. Perhaps I will die soon. Perhaps not. I do not die easily. I removed the tubing from my arm. And stand. At my feet lies the body of Mrs. Fender, mother of Eddie Fender, who also died, who also lies dead, in a freezer at the end of the hall. Do we remember what happened? She chopped off Eddie's head with an axe. Eddie had been a vampire, a very powerful one. Before I cut off his head, I step over his mother's body to search for a clock. Somehow, fighting the forces of darkness, I have misplaced my watch. A clock ticks in the kitchen above the stove, ten minutes to twelve. It is dark outside. I have been un unconscious for almost twenty-four hours. Joel will awaken soon, I know. And then we must go. 
but I do not wish to leave the evidence of my struggle with Eddie for the FBI to examine. Having seen how Eddie stole and used the blood of my creator, Yaksha, I know I must vaporize this sick house. My sense of smell is acute, as is my hearing. The pump that cools the freezer is in the back is not electric, but powered by gasoline. I smell large amounts of fuel on the back porch. After I toss the gasoline all over the house and wake Joel, I will strike a match. Fire pleases me, although it has the power to destroy me. Had I not been a vampire, I might have been a pyromaniac. The gasoline is stored in two 20-gallon steel tanks because I have the strength of many men. I have no trouble lifting lifting them both at once, yet even I am surprised by how light they feel. Before I passed out, I was like Joel, on the verge of death. Now I am stronger than I can even remember being. There is a reason. Yaksha gave me what blood he had left in his veins. Before I buried him in the sea, he gave me his power, and I never realized how great it was until this moment. It is a wonder I was able to defeat Eddie, who also drank from Yaksha. Perhaps Krishna came to my aid one last time. I take the drums into the living room. From the freezer, I move Eddie's body severed head, and even the hard blood on the freezer floor. I pick them all up and place them on the living room, barbe living room barbecue. Next, I begin to break up the couch and tables into easy-to-burn pieces. The noise causes Joel to stir, but he does not waken. Newborn va vampires sleep deep and wake up hungry. I wonder if Joel will be like r my beloved Ray, reluctant to drink from the living. I hope not. I loved Ray above all things, but as a vampire, he was a pain in the ass. I think of Ray. He has been dead less than two days. My love, I whisper, my sorrow. There is no time for grief. There never is. There's no time for joy, I think bitterly, only for life, pain, death. God did not plan this, this creation. It was a joke to him, a dream. Once in a dream, Krishna told me many secrets, but he may, may have lied to me. It could have been like him. I am almost done throwing the fuel around and tearing up the house when I hear the sound of approaching cars. There are no sirens, but I know these are police cruisers. Police drive differently from normal people. Worse, actually. They drive faster, and officers in those these squad cars are anxious to get here. I have incredibly sense of hearing. I count at least 20 vehicles. What brings them here? I glance at Joel. Are they coming for Eddie? I ask him. Or for me? What did you tell your superiors? But perhaps I'm too quick to judge, too harsh. Los Angeles has seen many strange sights lately. Many bodies killed by superhumans. Perhaps Joel has not betrayed me. At least not intentionally. Perhaps I betrayed myself. I've gotten sloppy in my old age. I hurry to Joel's side and shake him roughly. Wake up, I say. We've got to get out of here. He opens his eyes, his drowsy eyes. You look different, he whispers. Your eyes are different. Realization cross, crosses his face. Did you change me? Yes. 
he swallows weakly. Am I still human? I sigh. You're a vampire. I put my fingers to his lips. Later. We must leave here quickly. Many cops are coming. I pull him to his feet and he groans. You will feel stronger in a few minutes. Stronger than you have ever felt before. I find a big lighter in the kitchen. And we head for the front door. But before we can reach it, I hear three cruisers skid to a halt outside. We hurry to the back. But the situation is the same. Cops, weapons drawn, have jumped out of their cars with whirling blue and red lights cutting past in the night sky. More vehicles appear. Armored monstrosities with SWAT teams in, inside. Searchlights flash on and light up the house. We are surrounded. I do not do well in such situations. Or else, one might say, I do very well for a vampire. What I mean is, being stopped bring, brings out my most vicious side. I push aside my recently acquired revulsion for violence. Once in the Middle Ages, surrounded by an angry mob, I killed over a hundred men and women. Of course, they did not have guns. A bullet in the head could head could probably kill me, I think. Am I really a vampire? Joel asked, still trying to catch up with reality. You're not an FBI agent anymore, I mutter. He shakes himself as he straightens up. But I am, or at least they think I am. Let me talk to them. Wait, I stop him, thinking. I can't have them examine Eddie's remains. I don't trust what I, what will happen to his blood. I don't trust what his blood can still do. I must des destroy it. And to do that, I must burn down this house. Outside, through a bullhorn, a gruff voice man calls for us to come out with our hands in the air. Such an unimaginative way of asking us to surrender. Joel knew what Eddie had been capable of. I was wondering why everything smelled like gasoline, he remarks. You light the place on fire. I have no problem with that. But then, what are we going to do? You can't fight this army. Can't I? I peer out the front window and raise my eyes to the rhythmic thrumming in the sky. They have a helicopter. Why? All to catch a feared serial killer? Yes, such a beast would demand heavy forces. Yet, I sense a serious undercurrent in the assembled men and women. It reminds me of when Slim, Yaksha's assassin, came looking for me. Slim's people had been warned that I was not normal. As a result, I barely escaped. In the same way, these people know what know that there is something unusual about me. I can almost read their thoughts. This strikes me as strange. I have always been able to sense emotions. Now, can I read thoughts too? What power has Yaksha's blood given me? Alyssa, Joel says, calling me by my modern name. Even you cannot break free of this circle. He notices I'm lost in thought. Alyssa, they think there's a monster in here, I whisper. I hear their minds. I grip Joel. What did you tell them about me? He shakes his head. Some things. Did you tell them I was powerful, fast? He hesitates, then sighs. I told them too much, but they don't know you're a vampire. He too peers through the curtains. They were getting suspicious about how the others died, torn to pieces. They had 
my file on Eddie Fender, including where his mother lived. They must have tracked us here that way. I shake my head. I cannot surrender. It is against my nature. He takes my hands. You can't fight them all. You'll die. I have to smile. More of them would die. I lose my smile. But if I do not make a stand here, you will die also. I am indecisive. His advice is logical. Yet my heart betrays me. I feel doom closing in. I speak reluctantly. Talk to them. Say what you think best. But I tell you, I will not leave this house without setting it ablaze. There will be no more Eddie Fenders. I understand. He turns for the door, then stops. He speaks with his back to me. I understand why you did it. Do you forgive me? Would I have died, he asks. Yes. <clears throat> he smiles gently, not turning to look at me. I feel the smile. Then I must forgive you. He says. He raises his hands above his head and reaches for the doorknob. I hope my boss is out there. Through a crack in the curtain, I follow his progress. Joel calls out his identity and a group of FBI. I agents step forward. I can tell they're FBI by their suits. Joel is one of them. He looks the same as he did yesterday, yet they don't greet him as a friend. In an instant, I grasp the full extent of their suspicions. They know that whatever plague of death has been sweeping L.A. is communicable. Eddie and I left too many bodies behind. Also, I remember the cop I freed, the one whose blood I sampled, the one I told I was a vampire. The authorities may not have believed that man, but they will think I am some kind of demon from hell. Joel is handcuffed and drugged into an armored vehicle. He casts me a despairing glance before he vanishes. I curse the fact that I listen to him. Now, I too must be taken into the vehicle. Above all, I must stay close to Joel. I don't know what he'll tell them. I don't know what they'll do with his blood. Many of them are going to die, I realize. The SWAT team cocks their weapons. They call again for me to surrender. I twirl the striker on the lighter and touch it to the wood. I have gathered around Eddie's body. I say goodbye to his ugly head. Hope the popsicles you suck in hell cool your cracked and bleeding lips. Casually, while the furnace spreads behind me, I step out the front door. They are on me in an instant. Before I can reach the, er the curb, my arms are pulled behind me, and I am handcuffed. They don't even read me my rights. You have the right to a pint of blood. If you cannot afford one, the court will bleed a little for you. Yeah, I think sarcastically as they shove me into the back of the armored vehicle where they threw Joel. I will be given all my rights as an American citizen. Behind me, I see them trying to put out the fire. Too bad they brought the firepower, firepower but forgot the fire engines. The house is a funeral pyre. Eddie Fender will leave no legacy to haunt mankind. But what about me, Joel? Our, le our legs are chained to the floor of the vehicle. Three men with automatic weapons and ghostly faces lit from a single overhead light sit on a metal bench across from us. Weapons trained on us. No one speaks. <clears throat> Another two armored men sit up front. 
Beside the driver, one carries a shotgun, the other a machine gun. They are separated from us by what I know is bulletproof glass. It also acts as soundproofing. I can break it with my little finger. But what about the miniature army around us? They won't break so easily. As the door is closed and we roll forward, I hear a dozen cars move into position around us. The chopper follows overhead, a spotlight aimed down on our car. Their precautions border on the fanatical. They know I'm capable of extraordinary feats of strength. This realization sinks deep into my consciousness. For 5,000 years, except for a few isolated incidents, I have moved unknown through human history. Now I am exposed. Now I am the enemy. No matter what happens, whether we escape or die trying, my life will never be the same. I'll have to tear up my credit cards. Where are you taking us? I ask. You are to remain silent, the middle one says. He has the face of a drill sergeant, leathery skin, deeply etched lines cut from years of barking commands. Like his partners, he wears a flat flak jacket. I think I would look nice in one. I catch his eye and smile faintly. What's the matter, I ask? Are you afraid of a young woman? Silence, he snaps, shaking his weapon, shifting uncomfortably. My stare is strong medicine. It can burn holes in brain neurons. My voice is hypnotic when I wish it to be. I could s- s- sing a, a grizzly to sleep. I let my smile widen. May I have a cigarette, I ask? No, he says flatly. I lean forward as far as I can. These men, for all their plans, have not come as well prepared as Slim's people did. Yaksha had them bring cuffs made of a special alloy that I could not break. I can snap these like paper, yet they are seated they are seated close together. These SWAT experts and they have three separate Weapons leveled directly at me. They could conceivably kill me before I could take out all of them. For that reason, I have to take a subtle approach. Relatively speaking. I don't know what you've been told about me, I continue. But I think it's way out of line. I have done nothing wrong. Also, my friend here is an FBI agent. He shouldn't be treated this way. You should let him go. I stare deep into the man's eyes. I know all he sees is my widening black pupils, growing as large as the dark sides of twin moons. I speak softly. You should let him go now. The man reaches for his keys, then hesitates. The hesitation is a problem. Pushing a person's will is always a hit or miss proposition. His partners are watching him now, afraid to look at me. The youngest one rises half off his bench. He is suddenly scared and threatens me with his weapon. You shut your goddamn mouth, he yells. I lean back and chuckle. As I do, I catch his eye. Fear has made him vulnerable. He is an easy mark. What are, what are you afraid of, I ask? That your commander will let me go? Or that you'll turn around and shoot him? I bore my gaze into his head. Yeah, you could shoot him. Yeah, that might be fun. Alyssa Joel whispers, not enjoying my game. The man and the commander exchange worried glances. The third guy has sat up, panting, not really understanding what is happening. 
Out of the corner of my eye, I see Joel shaking his head. Let, let him see me at my worst, I think. It is best way to begin our new relationship without illusions. My eyes dart from the commander to the young one. The temperature inside their craniums is increasing, ever so slightly. Each weapon begins to veer toward the other man's chest. Yet, I know, I'll have to push them a lot harder to get them to let, to let me go or kill each other. It is not necessary. I can do it on my own, really. I just want to distract them a bit before I break them in two. With their guns aimed away from me, they are vulnerable. When I suddenly shoot my legs up, snapping my ankle chains, the, the third man, the one I left untouched, reacts quickly by human standards. But he is moving in slow motion compared to a 5,000 year old vampire. As he reaches for the trigger on his gun, my right foot lashes out and my big toe crushes his uh, flak jacket, his breastbone, and the beating heart beneath the two. The heart beats no more. The man crumples and falls into a pitiful ball. Should have given me the cigarette, I say to the commander as I snap my handcuffs, reaching over to take his head between my palms. His eyes grow round. His lips move. He wants to tell me something. Maybe apologize. I'm not in the mood. He is putty in my hands. Silly putty. Once I squeeze my palms together and crack his skull. Now his mouth falls open. On his, on his eyes slowly close. His brains leak out the back. Over his starched collar. I don't want his flat jacket. I glance over at the young one. He's more scared than before. I just stare at him. He has forgotten his weapon. Die, I whisper intently. My will is poisonous. When I am mad. And now, with Yaksha's blood in my veins, the poison is worse than the venom of a cobra. The young man falls to the floor. His breathing stops. Joel looks as if he will be sick. Kill me, he swears. I cannot stand this. I am what I am. I break his chains. You will become what I am. He is bitter. He has no illusions. Never. I nod. I said the same thing to Yaksha. I soften. Touch his arm. I cannot let them take you. Or me. Into custody. What could have... What could have a thousand eddies running around? They just want to talk to us, he says. I shake my head as I glance at the men up front, unaware so far of what has happened to their com comrades. They know we are not normal, I whisper. Joel pleads. You can escape far more easily without me. Fewer people will dull have to die. I leave, leave me behind. Let them catch me in a shower of bullets. My blood will soak the pavement. Nothing more. You are a brave man, Joel Drake. He grimaces as he glances at what I have done to the others. I have spent my life trying to help people, not destroy them. I stare softly into his eyes. I can't just let you die. You don't know what I have sacrificed to keep you alive. He pauses. What did you sacrifice? I sigh. The love of God. I turn toward the men at the front. We will discuss this later. Joel stops me one last time. Don't kill when you don't have to. I will do what I can. I promise. The bulletproof glass is two inches thick. Although the ceiling of the van forces me to crouch. I'm able to leap far enough 
off the floor to plant two swift kicks onto the barrier. I have exceptionally strong legs. The glass shatters into thousands of little pellets. Before the two armed men can turn, I reach forward and knock their heads together. They collapse in a mangled heap. They are unconscious, not dead. I remove the revolver from the hip holster of the driver and place the, the barrel to his head. The men in the back are dead. I whisper in his ear. If you glance in your rearview mirror, you'll see it is true. But I have allowed your partners up front to live. That is because I am a nice girl. I am nice and I am nasty. If you tell me where we are headed, I will be nice to you. If you don't, if you try to alert your partners on the road ahead of us, or behind us, I will tear out your eyes and swallow them. I pause. Where are you taking us? He has trouble speaking. C-14. Is that a police station? No. What is it? Quickly. He coughs, frightened. A high security facility. Who runs it? He swallows. The government. Are there labs there? I don't know. I've only heard stories. I think so. Interesting. I tap his head lightly with his gun. What's your name? Lenny Trevor. He throws me a nervous glance. Sweat pours off him in a river. What's your name? I have many names, Lenny. We are in a tight fix here. You and I and my friend. How do we get out of here? He can't stop shaking. I don't understand. I don't want to go to C-14. I want you to help me escape this dragnet. It is it is to your advantage to help and to the advantage of your fellow cops. I don't want to leave several dozen women widowed. I pause. Are you married, Lenny? He tries to calm himself with deep breaths. Yes. Do you have children? Yes. You don't want children to grow up without your father, do you? No. What can you do to help me and my friend? It is hard for him to concentrate. I don't know. You will have to do better than that. What happens if you radio ahead and say you need to take a bathroom break? They won't believe it. They'll know you have escaped. Is this van bulletproof? Yes. What did they tell you about me? That you were dangerous. Anything else? I asked. He, he is near tears. They said you can kill with your bare hands. He catches a clear view of the brain tissue dripping out of the commander's skull. It is a gruesome sight, even by my flexible standards. <clears throat> a shudder runs through Lenny's body. Oh God, he gasps. I pat him sweetly on, it, on the back. I do have my bad side, I admit, but you cannot judge me by a few dead bodies. I don't want to kill you, Lenny. Now that. We're on a first name basis. Think of another way for us to escape the escorts. He struggles. There isn't one. This job has the highest security imaginable. They'll open fire if I try to get away from them. Those were the orders. Yes, under no circumstances were you to be allowed to escape. I pondered this. They must know me even better than Lenny thinks. How that possible? How I left that much evidence behind? I think of the Colosseum. The next I broke the javelins I threw. It's possible, I suppose. I am going to escape, I tell Lenny, picking up the drop machine gun and shotgun from, fr from the front seats. I also yank a flak jacket off one of the men. One way or the other, 
They'll open fire, Lenny protests. Let them. I take ammunition for both weapons from the unconscious man. I gesture to Joel, who is still getting adjusted to his vampire senses. He's staring around the interior of the van as if he's stoned. But on one of the flak jackets, I put on one of the flak jackets, I tell him. Does it... Does there have to be shooting, he asks. There will be a lot of shooting, I speak to Lenny. What's the top speed of this van? 80 miles an hour, I groan. I need a car. There are a lot of them behind and in front of us, Lenny says. Okay. So we are going to stop for today. So, and tomorrow we will continue... The Last Vampire, Red Dice. And for those of you who are interested in YA Horror Mystery Adventures, that ha with a lot of laughs and vampires and teen romance, they're spooky and creepy like Fear Streets and Lost Boys, then you will like Vampire Juice. Amanda and Sean stumble upon a mysterious can of juice while searching for Halloween costumes at a local store. Despite being kicked out by the sales group, they become obsessed with uncovering the truth behind the strange shrink. With the help from some local bullies, they sneak back into the store through a crypt in the graveyard, only to find themselves in the midst of of a spine-chilling adventure. My link is in the bio. Thanks for watching, and I will see you tomorrow. The Last Vampire. Black Blood.